your life for the better. We're in this month of February where I want to help you guys out. Valentine's Day is around the corner. We plan family, uh, parents' night out for that reason, to give you an intentional date night. And in light of Valentine's Day, I wanted to look up uh, how it started. And you know, we really don't know the origins for all that it is, but it's obviously become a big deal where you're either looking for a Valentine, inviting somebody to be your Valentine, any single people in the house need a Valentine? Yeah, we got a couple. Look around, take notice. You got a Bible, got a job, ladies, pay attention. You might want to get a Valentine before you leave here today. Uh, but it's, it's that month where we focus on the love or getting a love. And certainly that's what the life is all about, that God is love. And he says it's not good for man to be alone. And life is about learning how to love and be loved. And when looking up where Valentine's Day came from, there's a lot of legends. It's actually interesting. We don't know. But we do know this. There was a lot of saints named Valentine who did some amazing things for God and were martyred for their faith because they had great courage, and that kind of gave birth to this idea, martyrdom, of love. And one legend has it that Valentine's Day came from one of these St. Valentines who defined the emperor's orders and secretly married couples to spare the husbands from going to war. Think about that, the irony of that, trying to save them from going to war by getting them married. And so I thought, what a great jumping off point to talk about marriage, is that marriage, it really is something that we're not often properly prepared for, especially this culture and the way that it paints it through all the romantic movies, and um, that it's, it's something that's going to complete you, and really in a consumeristic culture, it's hard to enter marriage with the right mindset and frame of mind as God designed it to be. We enter in thinking this person's going to meet all my needs and it's going to be wonderful when what we discover is that it's a place of spiritual warfare, number one, because it's the place that God has designed to make us more, most like Jesus, where we discover that we married a selfish person, and our spouse married a selfish person, and we have to discover how to work out by God's grace how to become a selfless person. And so it creates conflict because we have certain expectations, whether we got it from our childhood, from our parenting uh, that we saw and examples that we saw, and those expectations aren't fulfilled. And so we go in often with expectations not fulfilled, and then we communicate in ways that cause a lot of damage and a lot of strife, and it becomes more than just spiritual warfare, it becomes constant conflict and potentially resentment. And I want to remind us that Christ created this for a good cause, for human flourishing, to make us the best version of ourselves that we could possibly be. But it starts by looking at Jesus. And one of the things that we often forget is Jesus was prepared for a bride over the course of 33 years. He was being prepared by his Father in heaven for how to be a husband to a bride. His bride, the church, was taken from his side at the cross as Eve was taken from Adam's side. And the reason that is important for us to remember is Jesus was prepared to be a husband by his father through death to himself, through great self-sacrifice. And he asked his father, is there any other way for me to gain a bride? Is there any way for me to avoid this painful death? to be the husband that I need to be? And the answer is no. That just as Christ had to wrestle with putting our interests ahead of his own and die to himself at great cost to himself, with great agony to the flesh, to put his flesh to death, so husbands, to be the leader in the home that you're called to be, there is no way around learning how to die to yourself. And it's in that place that you find life, that on the other side of death is resurrection to a marriage that's dying today if you're dying on the vine. And so I want to give you hope and remind you that Jesus, it says in Hebrews 12 too, for the joy set before him took the cross. 
that he understood the attitude for his marriage must be our attitude, putting our interests ahead of his own, and it started with God's interests, and we have to put God's interests and our spouse's interests ahead of our own for the joy that God has in store for each of us. Ephesians 5, 1 and 2 and verse 21 really encapsulates this when it tells us to follow God's example as dearly loved children and walk in the way of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us. You see, the problem is not the idea of love. The problem is the reality of what love costs. We love the idea of love until it comes to giving ourselves up for the other. We want the other person to give themselves up for us, but we don't want to have to give ourselves up for them. But Jesus gave himself up for us, and he knew it was an offering to his Father in heaven. It was a sacrifice first to God. See, it all begins there. That that God loved us while we were his enemy. While we were in rebellion against him, he pursued after us and he gave himself up for us to win us, win our hearts to himself. And now for us who have received that love as a free gift, not based on our merit, he says, now I want you to do the same for the other and I will give you my Holy Spirit, my power to help you to love the other as I have loved you. Therefore, verse 21, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Today's message that I'm going to call you to is not out of your spouse's merit and what they deserve. I know what you think a lot of you think they deserve. The question is, do you love God and out of reverence for Christ, would you be open to the Holy Spirit's leading today to check a step that you can take in making your marriage richer and better for the glory of God out of reverence for Christ? Can you look at him suffering for you on that cross and the pain he went through and the agony he went through for you and say, whatever he's going to call me to, it's not like he hasn't suffered first for me. It's not that he hasn't gone first and led by example. And whatever agony it might cost to my flesh to do what he's calling me to do in my marriage pales in comparison to the suffering he took to marry me. The word submit here is a word used in a military context, and it means to be in order or rank. It's to get in order in alignment with God. It's the opposite of selfish assertion, asserting your will over the other's will. It starts with us humbly submitting to God's will, saying, Lord, not my will, but your will be done. I'm called to revere you. My role is what's going to be judged apart from what my spouse may or may not do. This starts between me and God and that personal relationship. What am I willing to do for God who has first given himself for me? So here's where I want to begin today. The greatest threat to most marriages, it's not from bad things. It's from good things that have called us to a place where we're out of priority. We're out of rank. So for example, having kids is a good thing. They're a blessing from God. But kids are selfish like us, born into Adam's nature. And they want to possess your soul. They want all your time all your energy, and they want to take you away from your spouse. They're jealous of your spouse, and you have to set the priority to make sure your marriage doesn't take a back seat to your kids. That's one example. Another example, right, is hobbies. So many people get married and You know, guys in particular, they've been playing sports. They've been in the leagues. They've been in the softball leagues, in the baseball league, or the golf league. And praise be to God for all these wonderful things. But you just got married to somebody in whom you said you're going to be like Christ to, and you're going to have to start putting their interests out of your interests, which is going to have to be some self-sacrifice at that time. And it's not that you can't keep some of those fun things 
in your life, it's just that they can't be at the same priority level anymore. Your spouse has to take priority. Good things that become bad things because they, they get out of order from God's priorities. And so today is a call for us to search our hearts and our minds and ask ourselves, am I in step with the Holy Spirit's desire of where I'm prioritizing my time and my energy, starting with my marriage? So I, on the overhead, and I put in the bulletin, because I'm going to give you a homework, a homework assignment, and please don't leave before that's given. Four needs of a woman and four needs of a man. Because the call that I'm going to call you to today is to ask the Holy Spirit to help you to, after prioritizing your relationship with Him, to prioritize your relationship with your spouse. That that needs to be your number two priority. So to know how to prioritize that, i got to kind of know what is the needs of my spouse. And so I'm going to remind you of four needs of a woman and four needs of a man. By the way, just... We're kind of old school here. We do believe boys and girls are different. I know it's controversial these days. Four needs of a woman. Security. Security, number one. She needs to feel secure from a man in the way that he speaks to her, in the way that he pursues her, in the way that he tries to keep her first. Open and honest communication. Non-sexual affection and leadership. Leadership in the sense of, guys, chauvinistic men have constantly used the Bible as a weapon against women. We, when we understand the Bible in context, to lead is to lead like Christ. How did Christ lead? He led in dying to himself. He led by example. So leading for a man means following Christ's example and being the first to seek reconciliation, being the first to humble himself and saying, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have talked to you that way. I shouldn't have handled it that way. I shouldn't have done that. Dying to self. Four needs of a man. Number one, man needs to feel respected. I, I know you know this, ladies, if you've been married for five minutes, the second that a man feels disrespected, talked down to, tone is like, something that makes him feel like he's a kid in a mother-kid relationship is the second he shuts down. And, and maybe it's unintentional and that wasn't your motive and maybe what you said is right, but the way you said it made him feel disrespected, guess what? He's checked out. Second thing that he needs, sorry, it comes, God created this, sex. Sex. Third thing, friendship in the form of shared activities. Nothing could thrill a guy more than when a woman is willing to find an activity they can do together for fun. You know, my wife and I, during these winter months, one of the special things we do is play darts. And one of the things I appreciate most about her is she doesn't complain when I beat her. She lets me go ahead. And finally, domestic support. And baked within these areas of, of needs is the five main love languages that people have. Words of affirmation. Like I said, how can a woman feel security from a man? One of the things you could do is work on words of affirmation. I was uh, listening to somebody recently who is a divorce lawyer talk about some of the main issues that he sees in dealing with couples at divorce. And he said, one of the things that I have told all my friends that has helped their marriage tremendously, guys, pay attention. If you checked out just this minute, give me your attention. You'll, you'll thank me later. Is he says, I tell guys, write a little note of encouragement to your spouse. It doesn't have to be, man, just, hey, I'm glad, I got, I'm glad you're in my life. I'll be thinking of you today. I love you. He said, every guy that is put into practice leaving a little note for their spouse, a word of encouragement, it's a game changer. Doesn't take more than three or four minutes. Words of affirmation, quality time, acts of service, gifts, physical touch. Both men and women have usually two of these things that are very meaningful to them. And God, because he has a sense of humor, usually brings you together with somebody who is the opposite. Right? <laughs> Opposites attract. It's not natural for you to meet your spouse within these needs. Oftentimes you're going to have to work at setting your will as Christ set his will to the cross 
to die to himself, to put your spouse's needs ahead of your own. And so I want to challenge you in light of seeing these needs. I put this in your bulletin as a take-home assignment. I want you to have a conversation first with God this week about coming together with your spouse and setting an appointment for an hour where you're going to talk about where are my needs and how can the other person help you in those needs? And one of the things I'm also going to have you do, I'm getting a little ahead of myself, is first in your time with God, work with God and identifying three things that you appreciate about your spouse and you're going to lead into that conversation with those three things. And the reason I'm, I'm setting that up is because we're in a day where there's been so much research done on couples that are flourishing. And one of the things that Gottman's study has shown us, that it's the most powerful study we know about couples and their interaction in marriage, is that couples that have three positive interactions for every negative re- interaction have the most solid marriages. You reverse that, it's almost a guarantee that if you're going to stay together, you're going to be separated. You might be in the same room, but your hearts are far apart. We need positive affirmation before negative affirmation. We see Jesus do this even in the book of Revelation when he's talking to his bride, the church. He's as much as he can starting with positive affirmations before he's getting into constructive criticism. We'll, call, we'll say constructive criticism. Now, we all need constructive criticism, but we need it delivered from a place where we feel cared for, from a tone of love and respect. And you want to get on a crazy cycle, here's the crazy cycle. Man feels disrespected, he makes his wife feel in love. Wife feels unloved, she's going to show him disrespect. And now we get on the crazy cycle. (laughs) Can I get an amen? Anybody been there? Is it just me and my wife? Yeah. Been there, done that. And so, so my challenge today, we're going to talk it throughout this series. We're going to get into communication more next week, so I'm not going to focus on that. My number one focus this week for you is how can I make sure I'm prioritizing my spouse's needs as the second priority of my life after my relationship with God? Am I out of order with God's will for me in that my spouse's needs are not number two, or number three, or number four on the priority list. In fact, I just, if I can get there, great, but my spouse's needs, you know, hey, they're not living up to their standards, so if I can squeeze in doing something nice for them, great, but not really high on the priority list. And what I want to challenge you with is that grieves the Holy Spirit, because believe it or not, Jesus died for your spouse, loves your spouse, wants your spouse to flourish in his called you to be his hands and feet to your spouse to help that happen. But that's also going to come back to hurt you and make you less than what God wants for you in your marriage. So I want you to think about it this way. I want you to treat time and energy like you treat money. And here's what I mean by that. I want you to get to a place with your spouse through doing some hard work of taking time, making an appointment on your calendar, to think about it this way, when you get in a pinch financially, the first things to go are what? The non-essentials, right? When money gets tight, you start to look at, okay, where can we cut it out? Where it's not, we're not cutting out the electricity or the food first. We're cutting out the fun and the restaurants, and we're going to eat at home more and not going to go out as much. That's what goes first. In the same way with your time and energy, I want you to ask yourself, When things get tight and things get busy, is the first thing to go priority with my spouse? Or am I making sure that if nothing else, my spouse is getting the best of me? To as much as possible. As much as possible. It's not going to be perfect, but if you're aiming for it, you can grow better and better. So, This is where the wrestling match happens. I already mentioned one thing we all have in common. You married a a selfish person, and they married a selfish person. And this is where the wrestling match happens. And I want to give you the most powerful antidote that we know scientifically and biblically to go along with that homework assignment. 
that I gave you, where you're going to look at those needs and you're going to give the other permission to speak into what their needs are and where they need it to grow. And you're not going to get defensive. You're going to work together by God's grace to talk that out. I want you to think about this. Since the 1970s, the community, the mental health community, has set out to, to study what makes people happy, what makes people flourish. And they have done an incredible amount of work across every demographic, socioeconomic category you can imagine, and they have found some amazing parallels to the Bible. Imagine that. God knows what he's talking about. And they've discovered that only 8% of your happiness, of your joy, is connected to your circumstances. Only 8%. You know why the far overwhelming majority, the number one indicator of your joy and happiness lies? It's your level of gratitude. It, it's over, they are stunned by what they have found about people and their level of gratitude. Do you know that the more grateful you are, your cardiovascular system is positively affected? Your psychology is positively affected? You, like, there's not a part of your being physically that isn't positively affected by your level of gratitude. Now, here's the problem, and I'm not going to have you raise your hand. A lot of you, if you're honest right now, you're not very grateful for your spouse. I shouldn't say a lot of you. I hope that's not true. Unfortunately, culturally, it's true. And I want you to think about something for a minute. Have you heard of the ink block test? Anybody taken an ink block test? The ink block test, it's 10 symmetrical ink blocks that are put before a subject, um, and they're, they're asked, to, what do you see in this ink block? And, and every person, you get 10 different people to look at this ink block, a lot of people will see different things. And one of the things that they started to recognize was you saw, according to your emotional state, upon taking that ink block test. So if you were in a negative emotional state, you would see certain things. If you're in a positive emotional state, you would see different things. Isn't that interesting? In the same way, when resentment comes into your marriage, when you don't feel like your, your spouse is meeting your needs or prioritizing you, when the devil gets a foothold, we say, which is a mental stronghold, where you're just replaying all the negative things, Guess what? You can only, your frame of mind is constantly compounding on what you're seeing that's negative. But the more that we can work with Jesus Christ to recognize his patience with us and his kindness towards us and his self-control towards us and his sacrifice for us while we were sinners, the more that we can recognize how much mercy he's given to us, the more that we can frame through our spouse the fact that we can see the good with the bad. You see, there's one thing we all have in common apart from Christ. Good and bad runs down the middle of every one of us, amen? And if you can't ever see good, it's because Satan has gotten a stronghold. Now that's generally speaking, of course there's always the exception to the rule, but generally speaking, if you can't ever come up with positives that you can see in your spouse, it's probably because you're just telling yourself a narrative over and over and over again of negative, 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 negative. And what I am challenging you to do today is to take time with God and say, God, help me to see my spouse as you see my spouse. And so I want you to write down the things that you see that are positive they're doing and that you appreciate, I want you to tell them that, to lead them the conversation, and I want you to go through the needs of a man, the needs of a woman, along with your love languages. And by the way, you can take a test in the five love languages. A good way to identify yourself in that is to just know the thing that you naturally do is probably your love language. So if you naturally like to give gifts to people, you probably are someone who really appreciates when people give gifts to you. If you're not someone who's good at giving gifts to people, but you love words of affirmation, that's probably your love language where you can just naturally encourage other people. That's probably what you want in return. And you can talk about that. And I want you to give each other permission to say, hey, we're on the same team. 
Let's talk this out and let's get better at prioritizing God first, praying together, praying separate, and then prioritizing each other's needs second. And here's where I want to close with you today, why this should be the priority. And this is for everybody here. This is if you're single, if you're young, I know we've got the youth in here today. There's this law that we talked about with money, and it's true of every arena of your life. It's the law of reaping and sowing. And I, I want to remind us today, you will never get a crop to fuel you in any relationship if you're not willing to sow good seeds to the other. Some of my favorite stories uh, that I've heard, and I'll just give you one. I had a friend who uh, would go to the gym, and he talked about the fact that it, he had, the lady behind the counter was like the meanest, angriest person he'd ever met. And he would always kind of just, she would look away, she'd be mean and rude. It's like, how, are you, how do you have this job still? I don't even know. You just avoid her at all costs. But one day he was like, you know what? He's more stubborn. I'm going to crack that nut. I'm going to get through to this girl and go, what the heck is going on? And so he would just make a point to annoy her with kind words every time he went in that gym. Hey, good to see you. And, and it was like, it made her even meaner every time. It ticks her off. And by the way, with your spouse, it might be the same way. Like, hey, why are you being, what, did you, what did you do? Why are you being so kind? If you're here without your spouse, say you start putting this in practice. But over time, started to chip away at this lady. And one day, he forgot to say something, and as he was walking out the door, she stopped him and said, hey, aren't you going to say something nice? And he thought, whoa. And whether it be with your work, where you take time to, 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 if you hate your job, take time to say, you know what, I am grateful for the paycheck. You know, I am grateful for the vacation time. I am grateful for the health care. I am grateful for the vacations I, I can take. You know, if you will take time to talk about what you're grateful for, you'd be amazed at the way you look differently at the job, at the spouse, at the person. Here's one thing I know for sure. If you sow negative seeds, you're always going to get negative back. It's never going to bless somebody and say, man, I really want to bless you when you cuss me out. That just... Blesses them. I want to bless you in return. But when you take me off guard and I know I don't deserve love, I don't deserve kindness, I've screwed up, and you shock me, and you practice kindness and blessing in return, let me tell you something. There's nothing more humbling that will make you want to cry than when you get unmerited favor because you're watching Jesus Christ embodied in that moment. That's where heaven and earth become one in those moments, when you are loved in undeserved, unmerited ways. And what does that do? It gets your affection towards the other. It turns the corner. And I'm telling you, if you're struggling today in your marriage, you need to start putting good seed there. you got to do the hardest thing. you got to be like Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, sweating drops of blood. Oh, I don't want to do it. You know, nobody's thrilled with what the Bible has to say about marriage. You know that? They're thrilled what it says about the other, but when you read, but when you read it for yourself, you're like, I don't want to do I don't like that. Never talk to somebody who likes what God says about their role in marriage, but here's the thing. It works. Do you want to be right or do you want to have flourishing? It comes through death to self. Just as Christ died for us. And so you're never going to reap more than you so, and the measure you use will be measured back to you. That's generally speaking. Of course, there's exceptions to that rule. But generally speaking, somebody's got to die first. And gentlemen, if you want to be the leader in your home, I'm telling you, that's where you can example Christ. You be the first. You take responsibility. You stop blame shifting. You stop making excuses. And you go and you apologize and you go, I'm going to lead. I'm going to pick up my cross. I'm going to die. I'm going to put your needs ahead of my own even if I don't get in return. And see, that's the thing I want to conclude with here before we go to communion. And this is why this illustration is so powerful. It takes time to reap a harvest. If you're struggling today, I'm telling you, if God is speaking to you through me in this moment, 
You're not going to start, you're not going to plant some seeds tomorrow and Tuesday and expect everything to turn around, okay? Don't come to me next week and go, I did it all week and it didn't work. You don't get a harvest overnight, right? When you're putting seed in the ground, you know it's going to take some time and some cultivating. In the same way, if there has been years of compounded interest the wrong direction, it's going to take time of good sowing to get it back. But Jesus Christ, if you do it unto him, he is able to redeem situations that you thought were unredeemable. I just feel led to say this real quick because I have somebody very close to me that royally, royally screwed up in his marriage and royally, royally lost his heart in his marriage. And he is a living testimony to me on a continual basis of the fact that if you will set your face like flint by God's grace and you will continually plant good seeds even when you don't feel like it, God will get you back to where you need to be. He is back in a honeymoon phase at a time when he literally was just exercising what the Bible says with no emotion whatsoever. But over the course of a year, God saved and redeemed and restored and renewed. And I'm telling you, agape love, there's no feelings about it. Now, feelings are there sometimes, but sometimes you just got to set your will to do the right thing, and it will compound. And here's the Bible's promise for you in closing. A man reaps what he sows. Whoever sows to please the flesh will from the flesh reap destruction. Whoever sows to please the Holy Spirit from the Spirit will reap eternal life. Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. And I'm saying, don't give up. Don't give up. It's not too late. I promise you, as Satan wants you to believe it's too late. I married wrong. Somebody's out there that's more perfect from me. I promise you, it's like trading in for a new car. It, it's going to be great for a week, and then there's going to be another car with new problems. We always marry the wrong person because, guess what? Apart from Christ, we're the wrong person. Love is a choice of the will of putting our interests aside for God's interests and the other's interest. And for the joy set before him, Jesus took the cross for us. And if we will pick up our own cross for him, he will give us the strength, he will give us the grace to turn it around wherever you're at today. And you can be an example for this world that desperately needs one of the difference that God can make in a relationship. So I want to go to prayer with you right now, and we're going to prepare our hearts to take communion. And communion is the perfect way to end this sermon because communion is really like a marriage covenant vow. And communion is for anybody who has vowed to Jesus, Jesus, I've decided to follow you. Jesus, I want you to be the leader, the Lord of my life. We remember first that Jesus gave himself for us. And he doesn't ask us to do anything that he's not going to help us do or that he hasn't done first for us. And so I want you to take communion today with the heart posture that says, Lord, not my will, but your will be done. I'm grateful for your marriage covenant to me. I am grateful for the fact that you've promised never to leave me nor forsake me. I'm grateful for the fact that you are patient, that your, your mercy is new every day, that your grace is limitless, that you are constantly, Lord, after me, no matter where I'm at today, no matter how much I've blown it in my marriage, in my life. God, I can be grateful that you're here to forgive and restore and bring alignment again and to start a healing process. You know, the whole point of communion is that we come with gratitude as we remember Jesus' commitment to us. And I want us to pray for strength as we take communion from God, for for renewal on the inner man. 
to put our spouse's needs and interests ahead of our own. Now, this is not to be something that violates God's will, of course. But is as reasonable within God's will as the Bible presents it. We are offering ourselves first to Jesus Christ for him to give us his love and his nature that enables us then to give ourselves to our spouse and be Jesus' hands and feet to them and strengthen them and make them the best version they can be while making us the best version of what we can be. That we can get to heaven one day and look at each other and look, man, look at how God used us to shape and mold the best version of each other that we could possibly be. So Heavenly Father, we come in Jesus' name. And we thank you, Holy Spirit, Spirit of truth, for how you've been speaking to each one of us what we need to hear today. And we thank you for your example, Jesus, <laughs> that you were willing to give up heaven for us. You were willing to die to your rights. You stood before those who mocked you in silence because of our need. When everything inside of you wanted to get out of that situation, when you could have just called angels down to deliver you, we thank you and praise you, Jesus, that you stood still. And you took the cross. And you met our deepest need of forgiveness of sin. And you rose again that we can rise again stronger and greater through your Holy Spirit. And God, I pray for everybody today to believe, to really believe in you in your ability, in your power, in your strength for our weakness, for our susceptibility, God, to turn inward and get defensive and not think that we can actually be a part of healing our marriages, of healing broken relationships, of sowing good seed because there's just been so much bad seed sown. And I just pray, Holy Spirit, that you would cleanse hearts today that you would get the glory today, that for your namesake, out of reverence for you, every one of us would take an inventory of how we've been prioritizing our lives and recognize how seriously you take the covenant of marriage and how seriously you want us to succeed there and how amazing the work you can do in making us like your son Jesus can be done in that covenant. So God, help us to die to ourselves. Help us to surrender to you and our rights and our egos and our pride and to stop arguing and just start, Lord, thanking you first and foremost with gratitude that we've been forgiven, that anything we're holding against our spouse, we've hurt you in the same way and you've been gracious towards us. So I pray that you will help us, God, to begin a process in this sermon series of healing, of releasing our bitterness, our unforgiveness, our hurt, our pain to you, Lord, and know that you will do what is right. Vengeance is yours. You will repay. And give us wisdom and revelation for what our calling is. What, what are we to do in the marriage, Lord? How can we better prioritize our spouse's needs? How can we make sure, Lord, that we're your hands and feet and making them strong where they're weak and vice versa? So God, do your work through communion. I pray that you'll bring a special blessing here that as we partake of you and remember what you've done, that Lord, you'll strengthen us on the inner man. You'll refresh us. You'll renew us. You'll heal us for the glory of your name.
at the Passover meal with his disciples. Jesus took bread. And he says, this represents my body, which is going to be broken for you. And I want you to take this in remembrance of me. So church, would you break that bread with me right now? Jesus knows where you're broken. And he wants to make you whole. And he wants you to consume him, his word. He wants to renew your mind in helping you make your marriage whole again where it's broken. So let's partake together with gratitude. Likewise, after supper, Jesus took a cup and he gave thanks. And he gave it to his disciples saying, Drink ye all of this, for this represents my blood which is poured out for the forgiveness of sin. Listen, wherever you've fallen short today, there's forgiveness. Jesus will blot out your past. You don't have to carry your sin with you. He will cast it away from you as far as the east is from the west. Maybe Someone in your life is going to hold your sin over your head the rest of your life. Jesus won't do that. Jesus can give you a new beginning today. He can cleanse your heart today. So let's take right now with faith and gratitude. Jesus, we thank you for hope. (laughs) Encouragement. Lord, maybe we couldn't save the marriage and the marriage is too far gone. Maybe we're already divorced. Maybe we're feeling tons of guilt and shame. I thank you, Jesus, that while you hate what divorce does to people, you never hate people. You love every one of us. And you meet us right where we're at and you rebuild and you restore. And so, God, I pray first and foremost for every marriage in this place that it will grow stronger through this sermon series. And today, Holy Spirit, you take what we've heard and you'll help us take next steps with you. And that you'll remind us that you're with us in each step. And that you'll help us to remember we're accountable to you, first and foremost. And this is unto you, first and foremost. And so, Lord, I thank you that you are there, you are with us, to help us and renew us and restore us. God, take today's message, take these tools and use them to build us up strong for the glory of your name. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I, we have a closing song at this time. So our worship team is going to come. And if you need prayer in the meantime, I invite you to come and I'd be happy to pray with you if that's what you need. Um, But otherwise, we're just going to thank Jesus that he has heard your prayers. He's gone before us. He's at work right now in this room.